Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I am an Episcopal priest in long-term recovery, and i um, glad you came back. Um, my story is uh, at about 20 years sober. I was feeling kind of lost and drifting, and that's when I got into a study of the history uh, of uh, AA, where it came from, how it originated, and particularly a prayer practice that they were doing back in the very early days of the program and that thing somehow managed to get lost. So uh, I started studying it, uh, practicing it, and it really totally changed my program and my life. And uh, I think that's kind of why I'm here today, that uh, I got interested in history. And that's what I try to do on the podcast, uh, teach a little bit about our background of where the program came from, dig into the psychology a bit so that we get, you know, not just kind of, um, slogans and, and simple, uh, well, I do try to keep it simple, but to, to also go a little bit deeper into what's, what's behind the, the transformation, the change that the program is designed to uh, bring about. And then finally, the spirituality, uh, try to make that real, and, uh, approachable for uh, people in recovery. So um, if these podcasts are helpful for you, I'd encourage you to share them with a friend um, and invite you to also visit our two-way prayer website if you haven't done that already. The series that we're doing right now is uh, on a pamphlet. The pamphlet is titled How to Listen to God. It was uh, uh, an Oxford group pamphlet that uh, originated in Ohio. Chaplain John Batterson wrote it member of the Oxford group, and uh, it was in the late 1930s, circulated in Akron, and um, it's probably the best thing that I have found for uh, a basic understanding of what two-way prayer is all about, and so I was given this pamphlet by an AA archivist, and uh, I started using it and um, putting it into practice. Uh, taking the, uh, the simple set of instructions that they gave here and uh, trying to do them. In this episode, um, what I want to do is approach it not so much from an historical uh, perspective, uh, you know, give you lots and lots of quotes. Sometimes I do that. But I really wanted to st try to understand the pamphlet, get, get into what the meaning of it is and, uh, and explain it in a way that hopefully you can start putting it to work in your prayer life as well. So a quick one minute review of uh, how we've gotten to this particular episode. In, in the first one, first episode, I had uh, Wally P come on. Wally's an archivist from Tucson, Arizona, known him for many years. And uh, he has probably done more to uh, make this pamphlet widely known in the recovery community than anybody I know. Um, and he found or came across a man by the name of James Hauk. Uh, I knew James, uh, visited him at his home and uh, uh, learned quite a bit uh, from him. He got sober the day after Bill Wilson did, stayed sober in the Oxford group and, uh, and was really deep into prayer and meditation and um, just, a, just an amazing man, lived to be uh, over 100 years old. And um, then we, we, anyway, we started looking at the pamphlet. Uh, very important point is that uh, they approach this prayer practice as an experiment, just like uh, the original use of the steps was meant to be an experiment. Uh, take it into the laboratory, see if it works, try it, uh, do it for X number of days and, and see what the results are. Um, then we got into their understanding of God in another episode and uh, the fact that God has a plan for our lives, that he wants to be in touch with us, uh, communicate with us. And I'm going to do another series, I think, on Carl Jung and his understanding of God, because uh, it kind of matches that in some ways, that the, the human ego is not... Uh, the be all and end all that some of us think it is, that there's actually another presence inside of us, um, a true self, uh, some people call it the greater personality, is the way um, Jung referred to it. But 
it's important to be in conscious contact with this voice, this presence. And that's, uh, that's what two-way prayer is really all about. So uh, the pamphlet uh, is broken down when it gets to the teaching of it uh, into 11 uh, different points. Uh, and um, I wanna go through the first five in this episode, and then we'll do the last batch uh, in, in the following episode. So very simple. Um, uh, if you have a copy of it, good to follow along. If not, uh, don't worry, you, you can get it. I've got it uh, listed in the show notes. Uh, make sure you print it out and try to study it along with us. So here's the first point. It says, uh, take time. Find some place and time where you can be alone, quiet, and undisturbed. So this is a practice that's really meant to be done individually. It's meant to be done in, in your own home. Um, I find it really helpful to try to make a special place at, at home where you're always going to be uh, coming to do your, your two-way prayer, your quiet time. And that really helps you kind of get in the mood. Like as soon as you sit into that chair, you kind of know... Uh, uh, and expect that uh, something very special is going to happen there. It says most people have found that the early morning is the best time. Uh, I, I've read, you know, dozens of Oxford group books, and, and all of them say exactly that thing. It's, it's the morning quiet time. It's the morning uh, hours when we get up, uh, you know, uh, before the other people in the house have gotten up, uh, go, to, go to wherever it is you're gonna do your practice, uh, have a cup of coffee uh, by all means, and, uh, and then prepare uh, to be in what the book calls, the big book, hey, conscious contact. Uh, we're gonna establish uh, some way for conscious contact with this higher power. Uh, try to set aside enough time uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, I, I generally do about an hour and uh, that's what's recommended, but uh, 10 or 15 minutes, if, if that's all you can do in the beginning, uh, it's better than nothing. So uh, start with that. Uh, and then have your paper and pencil uh, handy, pen, uh, notebook ready to record. Uh, what happens during your, your prayer practice. So that's the one first uh, bit of uh, advice here, take time. Second one says, relax. Sit in a comfortable position. Um, so uh, you don't have to be on your knees. Uh, don't be in bed. Uh, I, I don't recommend that. Uh, it's too easy to, to fall, uh, fall back asleep. But sit in your chair. Uh, sit comfortably. Then it says, consciously relax all your muscles. Be loose. There is no hurry. There needs to be no strain during these minutes. God cannot get through to us if we are tense and anxious about later responsibilities. So relax. Uh, some deep breaths are uh, always uh, helpful. I know some people who do yoga. I know some people who do uh, listen to music uh, prior to uh, starting to do the writing. Um, it's, it's what the program says, you know, uh, let go, let God, easy does it, relax. Um, and I think what's really gonna happen during this, this process is there's gonna be a shift that goes on inside. There's going to be a shift from the left brain, the cognitive analytical part of our minds, to accessing the functioning of the right brain, which is the, the spiritual, the artistic, um, the mythic, the poetic, that part of our minds, which is very, very different. Uh, Cognitive is very good for doing your taxes. Uh, don't go to your right brain for that. Stay left. <laughs> but, but when you're doing prayer and meditation, 
uh, and you're doing art and music, it's the right brain that's gonna, gonna be functional. So I, I always uh, kind of imagine myself shifting internally from, uh, from a thinking stance to a, uh, a praying uh, and connected and listening mode. Listening mode is what I call it. Then they say, tune in. It says, open your hearts to God, either silently or aloud. Say to God in a natural way that you'd like to find his plan for your life. You want his answer to the problem or situation that you are facing just now. Be definite and specific in your request. So what is my need? Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't have uh, the, the, the 12 steps. The Oxford group didn't have any steps, uh, but they had kind of a, a process and, and, and uh, watchfulness was part of the process, looking at themselves. Uh, we've got step 10, continue to take personal inventory. When we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So what I try to do, and um, since, since you know we've been uh, maybe come 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 a bit further than they did in this practice, is is to set aside a few moments to look, to watch, to watch inside, to see if uh, if I'm disturbed in there, if I'm frightened, if I'm angry, um, if. if, if Whatever, you know, I'm, I'm a kind of a Star, Star Wars fan. Is there a disturbance in the force? I'm looking at that connection to the voice, to the God uh, within, and I'm looking at my life and I'm kind of searching. Is there something wrong? Is there a need that I have? And then I'm looking outside my life. Is, is there something coming up this day that has me frightened? Um, something that has me anxious? I mean, you watch the anxiety that's present in your life. And uh, then you're going to, you're going to, after I've watched that, I'm going to express that to God in a need. See, that's exactly what it's saying, either silently or aloud. Uh, and my recommendation would be you write it down in the form of a question. Silently or aloud, just say to God that you'd like to find out his plan for this, this thing that's going on in you, his plan for your life. You want his answer to the problem or situation that's facing you. So um, write it down, and then you're going to ask for help. Uh, and for guidance. God, please help me. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I need. Please help me. And then it says, you listen. Just be still, it says. Just be still, quiet, relaxed, and open. Let your mind go loose. Let God do the talking. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a, a new way of, of doing prayer. Uh, most people in their prayer life, they're talking to God. They're expressing their need. They're reading uh, set prayers. Um, they're reading scripture. <clears throat> this is not about that. This is about learning how to listen, practicing how to listen to the inner voice. The Oxford group people believed if you're trying to really do God's will, really trying to do God's will, intent on it, that God will guide you. God will express and reveal to you what his will is. For many years, I don't do it as much anymore. I might get back to it after kind of reading up on this. But for many, many years, I did what a number of Oxford group people did. They, 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 when they switched from uh, finding what their need is 
to move into listening, to shifting their mind into listening mode, if you will. They, they, they had a, a sentence that expressed that. So, so they knew instantly they, they, they were shifting from that left brain to the right brain. The phrase that they used was this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And they kind of liked it because uh, the use, their usual prayer before that had always been, listen, Lord, for your servant is speaking. So this was a twist on that. It's a, it's a 180 on that. And it came from a, a scripture, uh, the first Samuel. I'm not a great big Bible quoter here. I think most of you guys know that. But it's first Samuel chapter three. And the story's worth uh, uh, repeating. So Samuel, and this is the beginning of Samuel as a prophet in the, in the Jewish uh, scripture. So he's, he's a student. He's, he's in the temple with his uh, sponsor, let's say, Eli. Eli's his, uh, his sponsor. And, uh, and uh, he's learning from the old man. And they're, they're in, together in, in the temple. They're the only ones who are there. And uh, Eli's trying to go to sleep. And, and uh, so is Samuel. And, and Samuel hears a voice. And the voice says, Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel gets up, goes over to Eli, says, what did you want, Eli? And Eli says, I didn't call you. Well, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep, Samuel. And Samuel does. Um, goes back, uh, gets in his little bed there. And um, once again, Samuel, Samuel, the voice comes. Second time goes over to the old man. What do you want, Eli? I don't want anything. I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Goes back to bed for a second time. Third time the voice comes. But this time, Eli had said something to him. He said, listen, the next time you hear this voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He thought maybe it's coming from somewhere else. So here's, here's the set of instructions uh, actually from the Old Testament. Go and lie down, he said to Samuel. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel at which the ears of all who hear it will tingle. <laughs> Love that line. Uh, you know, so, so I mean, there's there's the expectation that when I when I I am shifting from seeing what my problem is, knowing my need, to now shifting into listening mode, and then saying silently or aloud, "Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening," and then get ready for a tingle. <laughs> Get ready for something to come. Um, it says thoughts, ideas, and impressions will begin to come into your mind and heart. Be alert and aware and open to everyone. I'm going to jump into psychologist mode here. What I'm doing in this practice, I believe, is, is shifting from my conscious mind to allowing my unconscious mind to surface, to come to the fore. Uh, I don't believe God is sitting up in heaven with a megaphone or something uh, shouting down uh, to me. Uh, but God is the great reality within. 
And that great reality that is within has business with each and every one of us, has a person that we are meant to become. And it will communicate who we are to become and how we are to be. And it's not just conscience, it's guidance that, that I will receive and I will know uh, that, that this is the right thing for me to do, okay? The guided thing for me to do. Now, this, the instructions get, get very uh, specific here, and I, I'm just gonna read them out, uh, and then we'll go back and, and look at them. This is number five, and this is where we write. So now we, we, we picked up our uh, pen and uh, paper, and my suggestion is just write your question down, and then uh, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then, and I would say, imagine, allow your ego to step one si to a, one side, park it there, and allow your imagination to begin to bubble up. You're in the presence of God. You're in the presence of this voice, this loving presence, as, as we said in one of the earlier uh, episodes. And, and it, it has a message for us. So we're going to try it the very best we can to listen for what that message is. Now, here are the set of instructions that they give. Write. Here's the important key to the whole process. Write down everything that comes into your mind. Everything. Writing is simply a means of recording so that you can remember later. Don't sort out or edit your thoughts at this point. Don't say to yourself, this thought isn't important. This is just an ordinary thought. This can't be guidance. This isn't nice. This can't be from God. This is just me thinking. Write down everything that passes through your mind. Names of people, things to do, things to say, things that are wrong and need to be made right. Write down everything. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, comfortable thoughts, uncomfortable thoughts, holy thoughts, unholy thoughts, sensible thoughts, crazy thoughts, be honest. Write down everything. A thought comes quickly and it escapes even more quickly unless it is captured and put down. Well, these were the instructions that, uh, that were given uh, by um, uh, Batterson, Chaplain Batterson, John Batterson. And um, I tried doing it this way for, for quite a while. I would sit there for several minutes um, and uh, I would write down whatever thought came, ask my question. Uh, it was very scattered uh, oftentimes. You know, if corned beef sandwich passed through my mind, I'd, I'd write down corned beef sandwich. Uh, um, if, if somebody's name came up, a thought, I, I'd write that down. Well, I mean, that went on for some time, and, and it was helpful. I mean, I, I would look back on it, and, you know, sometimes I'll tell you this, uh, sometimes when I'm doing a workshop and I, I try to, you know, teach people how to do two-way prayer, um, um, someone will say, well, nothing happened. You know, I sat there for five minutes, had my pen, and nothing happened. Well, that's pretty much impossible. So my, my advice to people like that is you write down every thought that comes. Because unless you're dead, thoughts are coming. Write them down. Now, after you've done that for a while, I think you're going to start to find, or at least I started to find, that there were, there were thoughts that, that I, I just knew um, were, were monkey mind going on in my head. You know, I had not, so I'd call myself back. It's kind of like in centering prayer. You know, your mind drifts, and then, and then you, you use your mantra or, or whatever name of God, whatever, whatever you're using to pull your mind back so that you are centered and, uh, 
and attentive and present. Well, it's kind of like that. Uh, pull my mind back. I remember what my question was. I remember what my need was. I remember into, into whose presence I have come. And now focused again more on that. Listen for the voice. Listen for the voice. I also discovered the writings of a, a good number of Oxford group people. And uh, I don't know if they edited out the corned beef sandwiches or, or whatever, but certainly when I was reading their writings, I came to find that God could certainly speak in sentences and maybe in, even in whole paragraphs. So I began, uh, and I, I got quite comfortable uh, listening uh, for um, a, a monologue that's, that's speaking. Um, but on occasion, you know, I'll still go back to the old rules. And uh, if I'm saying, well, nothing's coming, write down everything. So, so uh, what I thought might uh, um, be helpful um, is uh, to listen, listen to some writing. So um, there's a book. Now, most of you are going to be familiar, many of you anyway, are going to be very familiar with the 24-hour-a-day book. Uh, it's a little, little black book put out uh, by Hazel Benight. Uh, I was raised in, in recovery on that book. There are any number of other uh, meditation books uh, that are out there. Uh, but this one is particularly important because uh, in... in fairly early AA in, in the 40s and 50s, I think it came out, uh, it, it, it got very popular. Well, where did it come from? Well, it came from another book. Uh, it, it, it was, it was a, a book uh, written, it wasn't written, it was the two-way prayer writings of two women in England. And um, there was a, an Oxford group member named A.J. Russell, a uh, newspaper guy, <clears throat> wrote a really good and important uh, Oxford group book called For Sinners Only. Uh, he had joined the, he actually had gone to investigate the Oxford group uh, for the newspaper. He's going to write it up as a scandal, you know, a bunch of phonies. And uh, he, he was so impressed with what happened that he joined the groups. And um, so he, he came across these writings, found them really beautiful, put them into a book form. Uh, it was titled, he titled it God Calling. And, um, and so for each day of the year, uh, he took and edited some of their writings, took out the corned beef sandwiches, I guess, if they were, if they were present and put them into, into form. So let, let, me, let me read one. Um, is from May 8th. Um, the voice says, I don't know what the question was. Uh, I don't know what their need was. Perhaps they were frightened. But the answer was this. I lead you. The way is clear. Go forward unafraid. I am beside you. Listen. Listen. Listen to my voice. My hand is controlling all. Remember that I can work through you better when you are at rest. Go very slowly, very quietly, and from one duty to the next, taking time to rest and pray between. <clears throat> next day, follow my guidance. Be afraid to venture on your own as a child fears to leave its mother's side. Doubt your own wisdom and rely on mine. This will teach you humility. So the meditations um, uh, in the 24 hour book are actually the two way prayer writings from these women in, uh, in England. Um, I found that really fascinating. Um, and um, so, so, I guess what I'm saying here is uh, I'm going to disagree somewhat with the uh, pamphlet 
in, in terms of, yes, write down every thought, every uh, idea, every name that passes through your mind. But in time, I think you will come, uh, as many people that I've uh, uh, worked with over the years, you, you, come, you come to let the crazy thoughts go and uh, focus in on the others. Um, let me give you a, a sample now of, um, uh, this is a woman who took the workshop that I do on, on two-way prayer. And uh, this was the answer uh, that she brought uh, as a result of that uh, just a short time where I asked people to write, uh, go off by themselves, find a place uh, in their home where they can do this practice. And, uh, and then we can just get, her, get, uh, get her around and, and share what we came up with. Here's what, here's what she came up with. Heavenly Father, I'm struggling with self-loathing. I feel unlovable. Please help. It's one of my favorite writings. It right? says, it saddens me when you're hurting so. You are loved more than you could ever know. I've watched you over these past several years go through some very painful losses, especially the loss of your grandson. I am real and I am safe. Speak only love to yourself. You will know self-love. You will begin to receive all the desires of your heart. Go now, I am with you. Um, some of you know uh, my books. Uh, my books here, uh, and some of you know uh, Bernie Kurtz. Uh, he wrote um, Mount God: The History of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so doctoral dissertations, one of the really better histories of, of AA. Wrote another. Uh, this was in, from an introduction to. Uh, uh, the Soul of Sponsorship, uh, 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 just to start an intro to that uh, book. And he says this, he says, uh, there are not only many meditation books today, there are too many. Squibs for daily meditation are useful for beginners, but perhaps some are being locked into beginnerhood into spiritual infancy. Meditation, like food, loses nutrients when it's canned. So you, 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 you've got the, the God calling book. I think there's Jesus calling books. Uh, I guess everybody's calling. You know? <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and you, people are reading those. And they're reading uh, one day at a time in Al Anon, uh, around the clock with Emmett Fox and all. all. There's, there's meditation books galore out there. And, and what I, I think this practice is going to teach you is why, why on earth are you listening or reading somebody else's meditations and not hearing from God yourself? not bringing your problems to, to God and getting the answer. You know, um, it's experience. Now, maybe a little rough, it may isn't, maybe isn't gonna always sound poetic, but it's gonna be what you need to hear. And it's gonna be conscious contact. And it's gonna make your prayer life real, you see? real, they were very big on experience. Uh, I had a friend, John Bradshaw, some of you may know, he did a lot of inner child uh, work, work stuff. And uh, Bradshaw used to say, uh, when, uh, when you go to heaven, uh, there's gonna be uh, two lines and one over the door, there'll be two doors there. And over one door, it will say, heaven. 
And the other door over it will have a sign that says, a lecture about him. And he says, most people are going to go to the lecture. You know, they're going to choose the lecture over the experience. Well, that's what I think you're doing. If uh, it certainly was, was what I was doing, I'm reading a little 24 hour book, uh, having a cup of coffee, and then off I go into the day. Well, once you start learning the history, you start to learn that uh, that was not the way things were done, that uh, the experience uh, was the really, really important thing. So um, maybe wrap it up with uh, uh, three or four quotes here from uh, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. Very important book. If you're going to get one book uh, to learn about the Oxford Group, uh, this is an AA published uh, book. It uh, came out in uh, 1980 or so. Um, just, just listen to some of these, these quotes. Uh, give you a flavor for what, what I'm telling you here and uh, how it was implemented back in the day. They said morning quiet time continued to be an important part of the recovery program in 1938, 1939, as did the spiritual reading from which the early members derived a good deal of their inspiration. So before the big book comes out, there was a heavier uh, reliance on prayer and meditation. Uh, they did a study, I've mentioned this before on the podcast, of what was, what was absolutely critical to the early pioneer program. And what they learned was prayer and meditation was actually more important than the meetings. Uh, it's not to say they didn't go to meetings, not to say they didn't enjoy and benefit from meetings, but the prayer and the meditation uh, was what was most significant in the early days. Um, this is from AA Pioneer's name is Duke Paddock. He says, when I started, they stressed morning quiet time, daily reading and daily contact. Here's Bill Wilson um, reflecting on why a couple, Wally and Annabelle, in Akron, had much greater success with alcoholics than did he and Lois in New York City. He writes this, Wilson, I think there may have been times when we attributed it to their morning hour of meditation. Bill said, I sort of always felt that something was lost from AA when we stopped emphasizing the morning meditation. And then finally, uh, here's a quote from uh, Paul S. writing about Dr. Bob. He said, Dr. Bob's morning devotion consisted of a short prayer, a 20 minute study of a familiar verse from the Bible, in a quiet period of waiting for directions as to where he that day should find use for his talent. Having heard, he would rigorously go about his father's business, as he put it. <clears throat> so there's, there, you know, there's, there's a nice sample of, uh, of the importance of this practice, uh, it got lost. And uh, I think it's really, really helpful uh, to bring it back. Uh, my program uh, had gotten very stale, uh, boring, and uh, relying upon meetings. And I still go to meetings today. I'm, I'm certainly not against them at all. Uh, but the morning quiet time and the two-way prayer has really taken on a much, much greater significance. I used to go to my uh, sponsor with all sorts of problems. Hey, this is going on, that's going on, what should I do? I do the same thing with God now. This is going on, that's going on. What should I do? Bring the question, bring the need, and then write down the response that comes because God does have a plan 
for each and every one of our lives. So um, I, I, I hope this, this, this is helpful. Um, the, the, I'll also put a link in there to the um, um, changes that I made. They're, they're not major, but I, I made some other changes in, in doing a practice, a two-way prayer practice that built on the, on the pamphlet. Uh, but I think added some things that uh, make it a little more modern and uh, a little more helpful. So what we're going to do next time then is uh, we're going to cover points six through 11. And what they are mainly about is making sure that uh, what we heard really came from God, that, that it has certain tests that the guidance must pass. And if it doesn't pass those tests, uh, it simply cannot be from God. So it's good to uh, you know have have these checks and balances, so that uh, you're uh, you're aware that um, you know like like Dr. Bob said, if it passes some of these tests and he listed them, you know I can't be too far from the truth, can't be too far from it. So anyway. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if it was, uh, please be sure to uh, let some of your friends and sponsees and such uh, know about two-way prayer. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, um, new interest that's going on out there in the 12-step community on this process. I'm getting emails every day from people around the world who are uh, tuning in, like the pamphlet says, and uh, finding the inner voice that uh, is absolutely honest, absolutely pure, absolutely unselfish, absolutely loving, and encouraging them to become the same. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening. Uh, God bless and keep coming back.